when you sort of see something that no one else has seen and you come up with a hypothesis of what it is and then you go to people and try to share that and you see that they don't believe you. So you're, you're met with skepticism and sometimes derision, so, which is the bad side of skepticism. And you know, I'm, I got pretty thick skin. I've been around a lot. Just put it aside. It took a long time for the derision to move totally to skepticism, to move to possibly, to move to maybe, to move, okay, you've proven it. We believe it. We believe it now. That only took 38 years. Well, I've always been intrigued by the Oaxaca Valley, and I had visited there many times, uh, traveling through motorcycle rides, and I was interested in maize culture. On the floor of the Oaxaca Valley, there's three or 4,000 different varieties of maize. We rented a house in a little town on top of a hill, and I just started working in the fields. So I worked my way down to the end of the Oaxaca Valley to Mitla, where I met this rather eccentric guy, Howard Lee. And he was the one who told me first about the giant maze. He just said giant maze, made a signal like that. It was pretty simple to understand that I should take the road north out of town. And I'd stop in a village and I would say, I'm looking for the giant maze. And it was, it was just this almost fantasy travel. I came around this corner and there was the maze. I was stunned. It was so tall, five, six meters tall. Huge, huge. And I, I just remember stopping and going, it really is giant maze. It really is something special. Normally, Maze has some roots near the bottom that look like these fingers, advantageous roots. But this one had roots seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven levels high, which was, I'd never seen anything like this before. And then as I looked at it, there was this sticky material, translucent, I call it a mucigel. I talked to them, I said, oh yes, that drips on the plants the plants grow. And then they said, there's no fertilizer in this community. And, and I went, bingo. It must be nitrogen fixing. What Howard observed changed everything. Nitrogen fixing corn was the holy grail of plant biology. Entire careers have been spent and wasted trying to achieve it. Nitrogen is the most abundant element in the atmosphere. Plants need it to grow, but most crops can't absorb it in its natural form. Early farmers used manure or other byproducts. This was unsustainable by the late 19th century. Enter Fritz Haber and Kara Bosch, who both won Nobel Prizes for discovering how to make synthetic nitrogen fertilizer at scale. It's estimated that a third of today's global population is fed and survives thanks to the Haber-Bosch process. But this chemical reaction also requires a lot of energy. It's responsible for roughly 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions every year, including carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. We can't change the fact that our crops need food, but we can change how we think about feeding them. We absolutely have to drive agriculture as a climate smart solution. We are gonna be one of the biggest, if not the biggest lever to, to create positive change. To do that, we need to work together with several different partners across the industry.
Jurassic Park came out when I was probably, I don't know, like 12 or 13 years old, that very formative age, right? Um, and what's interesting about Jurassic Park is you find out that behind the scenes, when that book was written, that technology was getting developed. Like, it was, it was real, right? You know, like the underlying technology of being able to read and write DNA was, was a real thing. And so when I, I, you know, went to MIT, I knew I wanted to be a genetic engineer. At Ginkgo, uh, the core idea is that DNA is code, right? So, so it's ATCs and Gs, not zeros and ones, like in a computer. But you can read it with DNA sequencing, like genomics, and you can write it with DNA synthesis, DNA printing. And like DNA printing is the thing that, like, as a bio nerd, it, it's wild, right? So, so like DNA sequencing means you grind up a cell, you get the DNA out of it, you put it in a machine, like a washing machine, and on the computer, A T C C G G pops up, and, th and that is th that is the code inside every cell. Right? You pick up a, a plant leaf outside or a microbe or a fish, and in there you could put it in a sequencer and see its code. All right? DNA synthesis is the opposite. You go on the computer, you type A, T, T, C, G, 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 A, A, hit print, and out of machines, again, in the lab behind me, that piece of DNA gets built to the spec, to the letters you designed. Right? That, that ability to read and write DNA is enabling us to design biology to do things that are important to us as humans. The Ginkgo platform and their, their technology is, is really quite incredible. So the premise of what they're working on is really taking nature. So what do we know from nature? What do we know about what these microbes do um, in their own environment, in the, in the microbiome around a plant? They're taking that knowledge and now really accelerating certain aspects of it. So they have the technology to be able to engineer those microbes to accentuate their ability to fix nitrogen, for example. So this type of technology and innovation is going to revolutionize um, the way that we farm, the way that farmers farm. It's going to be a huge benefit for them, as well as for the environment. There are certain crops, like soybeans, that you don't need to add much fertilizer to. Why? Well, on their roots are microbes running hay rebosh literally pulling nitrogen out of the air and producing fertilizer for the crop for free, okay? And those microbes, they just didn't happen to evolve to be on corn, wheat, or rice, which those three crops alone are half of global fertilizer usage. Just didn't happen. And so this is an, a great opportunity for synthetic biology. We can go look at the genome of the microbe on the soy read the DNA code, find the part of it that says, hey, here's how you run Haberbosch, hey, here's how you produce fertilizer, go on the computer, redesign it, hit print, and then install that code into microbes that live on the roots of corn, for example, and give them that ability to produce uh, fertilizer for the crop. That's, that's the project we've been working on with Bayer through Join Bio. Uh, I think the uh, biotechnology of, of programming cells will be essential to the response to climate change because biology figured this out. It makes stuff out of the components in the air. When a leaf falls off the tree, it is magically recycled back into subcomponents. This is how we should make everything. We should grow everything. It's the only way out of this uh, when it comes to the material infrastructure we need to, to survive. It's one thing to think about the potential to fight climate change, but it's another to think about parts of the world where farmers can't afford fertilizer and people need better nutrition. In my mind, there's two wicked problems. One is climate change. One is chronic hunger and malnutrition causing stunting. How do we solve them both simultaneously? 37% of the children under age five in rural Africa are stunted, maybe as high as 48% in India. We don't know about China. The United States, 7%. How could this happen? Well, it happened because they're not getting nutrition. So what, what would you do to fix it? So then you have a conversation in your own head. Well, I'll fix the food system in Africa. I'll fix the basic food system in the rural sector. And all of a sudden, people came from all around the world to form this uncommon collaboration. Competitors in the technology, competitors in the NGO world, just this incredible mixture of institutions all came together at this one moment, at this one moment to say, We'll work together. What you're talking about is too important not to do. 685 breeding programs later, it's working. 
13 crops have already been released that meet all of our criteria for higher nutrition, better yield, all these things that are agronomic. And in five years, there'll be 200 crops released, all driven to end chronic hunger and malnutrition. Now imagine adding nitrogen fixation into those cereals and grains. That's my goal. We need more willingness to, to go faster and to take a risk. So be bolder, right? Think about things outside of the box. Um, listen to the Dr. Shapiros in the 1980s. I'm heartened because I think if we all collectively decided we wanted to do it, we could do it. Rewind the clock 100 years on human society and think what it was like, right? I mean, insanity, right? You know, like, like you go back to the early 1900s, we had, you know, we had no airplanes, we had no nuclear power, we didn't even know, like, we, <laughs> we didn't know the structure of DNA. Like, the rate at which we learn as a species is incredible. So this was the quantum change. I mean, it's just one of those things that no matter how wild your imagination is, nitrogen fixing maize, nitrogen fixing rice, ending chronic hunger and malnutrition in Africa, it's actually possible. It's actually possible to take on problems like this.